Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Today, I want to do a deep dive into the economy, specifically the Biden economy, uh, with my good friend Steve Moore. Steve Moore, most of you know, is with Freedom Works. He's a Fox News contributor. Uh, he hosts a terrific show, The Steve Moore Show, on WABC in New York City. Um, he was also an advisor to uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, he's got a new book coming out that's aptly called GovZilla, uh, which is going to be coming out in September. And want to dive right into everything we've got to talk about. I highly recommend the book, although I just finished reading the first chapter and... A little depressing. There, I would find... You redefine depressing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's great. Hey, Steve, how are you? I, I'm good, <laughs> although I am... You know, Bill, first of all, thanks again for having me as a repeat performer on, on the Bill Walton Show. Um, look, I think this is an extremely dangerous time for our country. And I think what happens over the course of the next three or four months will have decades worth of uh, repercussions. Um, the people are running Washington right now are out of control. I think they're crazy. I think Joe Biden, Pelosi, and Schumer have an agenda to truly radically transform our country in ways that haven't been done in many, many decades. I think that you know when I first arrived here in Washington in the early to mid 80s, we had the Reagan revolution and that really changed. That was a fundamental shift. No question about it. I don't know if you'd agree with me that on that bill, but I you know, would yeah. agree. What, what, what Reagan did was just reinsert the free enterprise system and free markets. This, this, this may be a good time to ask this question. Demand side versus supply side. Mm -hmm. He was he Art Laffer, you and and Larry Kudlow were really behind the supply side uh, revolution. Not many people know what supply side means, <laughs> what, because it's, it's an important thing yeah. to understand. It is. It's it's the productive class, the people who produce things, the people who work, the people who save, the people who invest, the people who start businesses. They're the you know the contributors to the economy. The left seems to think that it's the people who uh, you know who are consuming. It's not consumption that causes growth. It's it's the people who create the creative class, the people so, who so, so, work and. And you have to you have to reward that you want to incentivize. I mean, economics is all about incentives. If, if you you know, we we just had this experiment on unemployment insurance where we paid people more money to not work than to work. Well, what is the incentive? The incentive is to stay home and on the couch and watch Netflix. Guess what people did? They stayed home. And I estimate we would probably have five million people more people working today if we hadn't done that. So, what government does and how it affects the incentives of people to work and save, invest, start businesses, and so on, uh, has a big, big impact. So at, at 35,000 feet, that's the big difference between the, the econ um, economic policy, which works for people, and the policies which don't work for people, which is what Biden, Pelosi, and Schumer are pushing our way. Except let me just, I've become a little bit more cynical, almost as cynical as you are. I mean, I, I think for the left, I really, I don't think that there's any kind of philosophy here, except for the fact that they want power. That these are people, I think we make a mistake, Bill, in calling the left socialists. Uh, they're not, I mean, they, you know, look, uh, socialists want to have a, a welfare state and they want to take care of people, and, and maybe they're good hearted, but they are, uh, it, they're misguided. But I think we're up against status who want to tell you what to do and, and control so many aspects of our lives. That's why, you know, what happened with COVID, you saw the left wanting to take the power to shut down businesses, to tell people if they have to stay home, to have curfews, to, you know, now you have all these new, uh, as we see the Delta variant now that, oh, this is another opportunity. They take a crisis. This is what the left does. They take a crisis and they say, this is why we need bigger government. This is why we need, you need to surrender your freedoms and give it to politicians. And so that's why this is a time you know, of choosing for the American people. Over well, I'd go months. further. I mean, they're all in their 70s and 80s, and they're basically saying, we want power now today, and devil take the hindmost for what happens tomorrow. And because of the level of economic ignorance in the country, the kids who, who think it's kind of nice and socialist mm -hmm. have no idea what cataclysm befalls them. I mean, at, 
at a, at a bigger picture level, we could take a look at the national debt as a percentage of GDP. And as you point out in the book in one of your charts, you know, the debt as a percentage of GDP matters. And the more debt you have, the more the economy begins to stall out. And mm -hmm. I think we're reaching a point now where debt as a percentage of GDP is the highest level since World War II and by far the highest level in the country's history. That's right. And so, uh, look, my feeling about this is, incidentally, you've got those numbers right. What we've done since you saw that first draft of the book is now we're looking at, okay, what happens if we pass the Biden agenda? The numbers are horrific, you know, so we don't go to 200% of GDP, we go to 300% of GDP, and you just, you get an avalanche, you know, it's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because your interest costs get higher. So, you you know, you know this of having been a CEO of a company. You can't just, you know, take your revenue and just keep paying the, the debt. And that's the crisis we're in right now. I just want to make one other quick point. The crisis is the, is the spending. It's the, it's the debt spending. You know, the left says, oh, well, we can just deal with this by raising taxes. But that takes away resources from people, too. But you've got an interesting scenario in the book. Uh, you talk about what's happened to Chile, Argentina, mm -hmm. the South American countries that decided that they were going to just engage in monetary recklessness. And you talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage one's tax and spend. So you're taxing, you're spending a fortune, you tax of things, tax rates go mm -hmm. up, you, you kill the productive class, and you begin to move into stage two, which is where you stop just taxing, you also start borrowing. Mm -hmm. Which seems to be like seems like where we are now. Big right, time. that's where we are. I mean, how much has the federal debt gone up in the last uh, twelve months? Uh, well, if you take all the spending, we're talking about again potentially about five trillion dollars. I mean, these numbers are so gigantic that it's and, that's the problem, Bill. The numbers are so big, people can't even comprehend. And if them. you add in what, what's on the table now, we're taping this in August of two thousand twenty-one. What's on the table now? We've got another. I've, I've lost track. Yeah, of I the know. Trillion dollars okay, spending, so let's do the numbers goes. really quickly. So Biden came in. He started with remember his one point nine trillion dollar bill. I can't even remember what they called it. The American Recovery Act or something. By the way, the American economy was recovering already. We didn't need another one point nine trillion dollars. But as the left likes to say, it, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So they sh and what that bill really was, was their blue state bailout. So all the, you know, blue states like New York and Illinois and California that shut down their economies, they basically took the money from the red states and gave it to the blue states. So, <coughs> so um, that was that bill. Then we had the um, uh, $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which I don't like to use that term because it's just a green energy bill. And and uh, it's uh, it's for windmills and solar powers and and that kind of thing. contrary to what people think, this is not going to roads, bridges, and tunnels. About one out of every four dollars okay. goes to you okay. know. So three out of four go to just right. left wing th uh, play toys. Um, so that's one point nine plus one point two plus. They have a three trillion dollar uh, what they're calling. I love this. They call it human infrastructure. It's just welfare <laughs> programs more. Obamacare and so on. So if my math is right, that's three. That's about five point one trillion dollars. Right. By the way, I don't want to scare people, but that's on top of the four trillion dollar normal budget that we pass. So it's four trillion plus all of this additional spending. These, that's why I say these people are are pretty lunatic. I mean, if a CEO tried to do this to a company, I mean, they would be thrown in jail. The, these numbers are going. I'm I'm worried about a massive financial crisis that could make what happened in 2008 and 2009 when we had the housing bubble bursting could make that look like a picnic. Now, did, that, did those numbers include what's on the table now that now has 17 Republican senators saying they want to pass it? Or is that's that, is the, that on that's top the, of that? That's the so-called infrastructure bill. So okay. the, and, and I don't understand why any Republican would want to get within 100 miles of that bill. It's transit fat, fat spending, it's green energy, it's electric vehicles, it's it's all this green gobbledygook stuff. Well, there's an awful lot of pork that comes back to their states. Of course. I mean, Manchin of is course. a Democrat, right. but I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of that spending that ends up in the states. So. But look, even the idea that the government has to build our infrastructure is ridiculous. Yeah. The 75% of the infrastructure, the physical capital of this country is built by the private sector. Why, why do we need the government to build out the broadband? Why do we need the government to... Uh, even roads. We have, there's private roads. We, we don't need the government sticking its finger in everything. Um, it's, by the way, it's twice as expensive for, uh, uh, to build a private road than a public uh, government built road. 
it's twice as expensive for the government to build a bridge than the, when the private sector builds a bridge because they have so many rules and so many mandates and so many uh, green energy policies that it just completely inflates the cost. This is a big giveaway, by the way, to the unions as well. Well, you and I have talked about it before, but I, I have a theory. My theory is that capital needs to be in the hands of people who know best what to do with it. Mm -hmm which is why if you've got money in the private sector, you keep it there, you, and people who've made the money tend to know how to reinvest it to make more money. It adds to uh, growth and productivity, mm -hmm. makes everybody wealthier. When you take that money and you put it in government hands, particularly federal government hands, you're a million miles away from the problems, and you read these bills, and they're like... Uh, they're like DreamWorks. I mean, there's, there's like, okay, we're going to do yeah. 150 billion for this or 75 billion for that, and you know where the, you can write this. You can write the, the the scene in the play or the movie. You get these kids, they're 27 year old staffers. It's 1:30 in the morning, and they're writing this 2,700 page bill, and they're saying, well, we just got a call from somebody. This they want that this, that. In. Let's do this, that, and the other thing. This, this. There's very little thought that's gone into this and even less thought about how they're actually going to implement the spending if and when it passes. Well, I'll just correct you on one thing. I mean, there has been thought that this is a 30-year plan. They've been, this is their dream. They've been thinking up this stuff for 30 okay. years. Well, I, so, know, yeah. so what they're doing is they're well, saying- Well, it reads like it was I know, exactly. Night. But these people, look, these people are not stupid, right? They're not stupid. I think they are mendacious. I think they, they are power hungry. But they've, if you look at every dingbat left-wing idea of the last 30 years, they're, they're going to put it in this reconciliation bill. So that's what I want. I want to make sure, Bill, that people are focused. Well, look, the $1 trillion infrastructure bill is bad. The, the, this reconciliation bill is a catastrophe. I mean, it's just massive amounts of welfare spending, massive amounts of new regulation, uh, the massive $2.5 trillion tax increase that includes the death tax, the capital gains tax, the dividend tax. They want to raise the payroll tax. I mean, everything they can get a hold of. This is transformational. This will make America look like France at best. I mean, we're, we're talking about taking our government share of GDP from 35% to 50% of our economy. And you raised a good point because you are a capitalist. You ran one of the most successful financial capital um, companies. So you understand how this stuff works. They don't want people like you making these investment decisions. Right. They want politicians to, I mean, does anybody think Nancy Pelosi has any idea where money should be invested? They don't have any appreciation for capital markets. And, the, you know, one of the things that's made America so rich has been the incredibly efficient well, capital markets. Well, we have. And they, uh, you're watching the Bill Walton show. I'm here with Steve Moore, and we're talking about the catastrophic spending that's going on in Washington. It looks like it's going to continue as far as the eye can see. The other thing about capital and private hands is you live with you have to live with your mistakes exactly i mean exactly. i had a i had a i had a right. on balance i had a really good track record as an investor but i had some things sure. that caused a lot of pain sure. and you pay a cost for that and i right? paid, I paid nobody the price. pays a cost nobody when the government makes a mistake yeah. right i mean we're spending i'll give you just another example i mean you're hitting all my hot buttons here but we have spent about 200 billion dollars over the last 18 months on unemployment insurance benefits. Now, the amount of fraud that's already been discovered in that program is between 40 and $50 billion. This, these are people who live in Nigeria, West Africa, China that are getting checks. From it's the almost United 25% States of the full quarter. Exactly. Of yeah. and, and by the way, nobody in government does anything about it. <laughs> I mean, they act as if this is the cost of doing business. Can you imagine if you were financing a capital project and you had a 25% waste in the, in the cost of that? I mean, these are outrageous. You know, the fraud, the amount of fraud in most kind of private sector, like with credit card companies or insurance companies, things is maybe one, two, 3%. We're talking about 25% rates of fraud. This, I, I, it, it is mind boggling, the incompetence of these people and the fact that they just sweep it under the rug. The context, though, now is that we got an economy which has come back from mm -hmm. the lockdown, and though we see, and we've got a stock market which is an all-time mm -hmm. highs, and yet you and I have talked about this before. To me, it's like two economies. We've got the economy that's the fangs: Facebook, Apple, Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Microsoft, all the all the big tech companies. 
they're seeing their profits up 50, 75, 100% quarter to quarter just in the last couple of weeks mm. when they've been reporting. So they've been making a fortune. So you're talking lot. about their profits. Their profits. Yikes. Yeah. Right. Um, so if the stock market's an all-time high, there's a reason. Earnings are going up. That's a mm -hmm. good thing, I suppose. Uh, not I suppose. It is a good thing. But on the other hand, you've got the, the half, the other half of the economy that's not virtual, not can't work from 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 mm -hmm. home, that sort of thing, and they've been crushed. Yeah, and yeah. the people now are getting three hundred dollar checks, mm -hmm. and so all this spending, all this so called crisis spending, is going in the it, going on in a time where people are feeling pretty good about economics, and they don't they're not paying a bit of attention mm -hmm. to the uh, the consequences of this. My question is. <laughs> What happens when that three hundred dollars runs out, or is that going to be? Well, continued? they want to make it permanent. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they're like, "Oh, this is great. We just keep paying people free money." Um, look, you make a very good point that almost everything we've done in the last eighteen months um, has really benefited the big businesses, the Amazons and the Googles and the and the WalMarts and the, you know the big stores and big box companies that have been. Uh, Home Depot to stay stays open. open, but the local the exactly. local hardware stores get that closed. That makes no sense. And then the left. You know, oh my gosh! Look, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Well, those are your dumb policies that are creating that kind of environment, uh, and it's it's a highly frustrating. So the the question, though, I mean, the the thing, the other thing that's happening that's become apparent in the last year, year and a half, is a lot of these big companies are becoming newly woke, and they found themselves maybe not newly, but it's emerging that they're woke. You got Coca Cola, Delta Airlines, Major League Baseball coming in on the side mm -hmm. of the Democrat agenda in particular in Georgia, trying to block the voting rights bill. And so this is really cronyism at a whole new level. It really is. Where you got, you've got left-wing corporations, or at least run by left-wingers, making common cause with the Democrats in Washington. And you're right. And, and so you've got a situation now where and as government gets bigger and bigger, it gets its bounty. You know, you have to basically genuflect in front of the politicians if you're a big business. And, and you know, more and more of your clients are not Americans, they're the federal government. And, you know, when we have the government controlling 50% of the spending in the country, that means, uh, you know, it's why you've got so much wealth here in Washington, D.C. We're three of the five wealthiest counties in the United States in and around Washington where we don't produce anything, but we have lobbyists, we have lawyers, we have politicians, we have, you know, legislators and so on that, that don't, all they do is redistribute, they don't create. So... You've, you've written a couple of books on energy policy. Could we dig into specifically what's going on there with the Biden agenda? Well, it's just it's fits the pattern. I, I, I'm I think almost everything Biden has done on the economy. Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bill. I can't think of anything that he's done that's right that's good for the for good for America. Give me the, a couple of days. Yeah, I'll, I mean I'll... it's <laughs> there's almost nothing, and so. You know, first they want to massively increase taxes. They say they want more investment, but they want to raise the taxes on investment, you know, through capital gains taxes and dividend taxes and so on. Then they say they want to build back better in the United States, but but all the private sector activity is being squashed because government's taking it over. Uh, and then, you know, you, you talk about the regulatory state. Um, all the people who've taken over the regulatory agencies of the Biden administration are... Um, extraordinarily anti-business. Well, P let me P give you one P example. Pete Buttigieg, Jennifer Granholm in, in, in Michigan's done such a fine job in Michigan. That she oh, had. yeah, exactly. And they, look, the woman who's running the FTC is a 32-year-old, you know, Yale Law School graduate who knows nothing about business, and she's going to be regulating our businesses. I looked at the 25 top people in the Biden administration, starting with the top, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, the Treasury Secretary, the you know Labor Secretary, the, the people running the FTC, the SEC. Do you know out of the top 40, how many years of business experience combined these people have? <laughs> Eight. Really? I'm Eight. not, I'm not making years? this up. They're all politicians, university professors, lawyers, uh, none of them know anything. They don't know jack about business. They <laughs> they don't know anything about what they're talking about. Well, I hope you. Don't. I mean, you alone have more business experience than the top forty people in the uh, Biden administration. 
And you know, they haven't been calling me. I know, <laughs> exactly. But, well, I hope you don't count Buttigieg's experience as a consultant. That doesn't yeah, count. Yeah, a, oh, a lot of them are consultants. We don't that's, count that. That's another class yeah. that doesn't have to live with their own Yeah, they're uh, community their organizers, decisions. the consultants, the lobbyists. They're, they're, many of them are just university professors who've been in the ivory towers. They don't know anything about profit losses, how to make a payroll. Uh, and that's going to catch up with us. I mean, that that is going to have an extreme negative effect. Well, the other thing you've you know, I've talked about is is this this monstrosity called uh, modern monetary theory. Mm -hmm. The unreality of that is just staggering. It is modern monetary theory. I don't want people's eyes to glaze over, but it's a very simple idea. They believe that they've found this sort of golden formula where all the United States has to do is continue to borrow and from now until kingdom come. And it's not going to have a negative effect because we're the world reserve currency and all these foreigners are borrowing money from us at low cost so we can keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, but that's like saying, you know, gee, if you jump out of the window of a 96th uh, floor of a building, you know, it's great until you get to the second floor, <laughs> until you squash at the bottom. I mean, th this is a story that is not going to have a happy ending. It is, it is a made-up theory by some you know, second-rate university professors at second-rate universities. But the left always tries to find an excuse to spend money. So that's why they embraced Keynesianism um, 50 years ago. Modern monetary theory is the kind of new Keynesianism. So these guys can spend ourselves to oblivion and still feel good about themselves in the morning. What's what's Kevin Hassett call it? The de-incentivizing or the de-something of oh. economics? Uh, and he makes a point that I think is the point you just made, is the, these are not first-rate economists that are coming up with this. And he says, look, if, if these guys ever try to go back into a reputable economics department, they're never going to get a job because it doesn't, you know, there is a theory of the firm, there is supply side, there is supply and demand, and those, those are laws. Well, and you make a very important point earlier, which is if you're in business, you're rewarded for your right decisions and you're punished for your wrong decisions, right? I mean, that's just the way the, the, the way the free market system works. Nobody is, is punished for making bad decisions in Washington. And so therefore, you know, there's no incentive for them to make the right decisions. The whole incentive in Washington, if you, if you run an agency or a department or a bureau is to grow it because that's how you get more power. So you just want to expand your, your regulatory reach. You want to expand your, uh, budget because that's how you get power. So your incentive is not to reduce costs, it's to increase costs. So uh, stage one, we talked about tax and spend, stage two, borrow and spend, and now we're touching on, I think, stage three, where these companies come off the uh, come off the rails completely. It's called inflate and spend. Mm -hmm. What about inflation? It's a problem, and I, I think the Fed is behind the curve on this. I think, uh, you know, we're seeing... The inflation rate now is between five and six percent, and I, I believe it's going to get worse before it gets better. I believe, um, you know, Biden keeps saying that it's transitory. So does the Federal Reserve Board uh, uh, Chairman Jerome Powell. Uh, Biden said one of the dumbest things I've heard a president say in my whole lifetime, and that's saying a lot. Uh, when he said a few weeks ago, he said, "The way to solve our." Um, of our inflation problem is to pass my $4 trillion spending and, and debt bill. And I'm saying, really? I mean, that's like saying the way to stop a forest fire is to dump gasoline on it. If the government prints more money, then that means more inflation, not less. I mean, again, this isn't, this is, you know, seventh grade economics. And yet Biden's really out there saying, oh yeah, if we spend more money and print more money, all that does is it's, this is dumping money out of helicopters, folks. It doesn't create any productive resources. It just means every dollar that you have in your bank account and your wallet and your paycheck is worth less. And that's why, you know, if you went to the grocery store three months ago, what, what you could buy for $85 now costs $100. You know, that it costs $16 more to fill up your tank. That's a real hardship to the lowest income people. You're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with my friend Steve Moore, um, a brilliant economist, and unfortunately his brilliance is dissecting the Biden budget and spending, and um, it's not a rosy scenario. So I want to make an important point, because I know we're running low on time. Yeah. I, I started out this conversation by saying I really believe the decisions that are made in Washington in the next three or four months will have 
decades worth of impact. And if the if the Pelosi gang succeeds, um, it's it's going to be to, it's going to be very difficult to repeal this stuff. You know, once something is put into law, we have to we need people in the streets. You know, we need you know peaceful assembly. We need people shouting it out that they are against what. Joe Biden is doing to our country. There are there are a lot of people who voted for Joe Biden just because they didn't like Trump, right? And so, I believe that most of the country is against this, and and we just have to stop as much of it as we can. The tax increase will be this will reverse forty years of progress we made on our tax code. We will now have higher tax rates than China. Bill, how are we going to compete with China if they got? Low, I mean, China has lower tax rates with the United States. I mean, what's wrong with this? Well, the only good news is China seems to want to reinstall state control over its yeah, businesses. Yeah, right. Well, so yeah, they exactly. May, they may, they may. But, but I mean, but, the point is that the, this is this is a important how, moment how, how, how cool. for conservatives to do everything we can to lay our bodies in front of this track and alert Americans to the dangers of our of our freedoms and free enterprise system. The from, reason I wanted to do this show is exactly that point. We've right. got to raise people's awareness exactly. that this is a really bad thing. And But yet, how clever are these people? It stri- as you're talking, it <laughs> strikes me, we're, we're talking about masks, <laughs> and we're talking about right. lockdowns, and we're talking about doing the same thing to the economy we did 18 months ago, which would be crazy. And so everybody's distracted. And then we've got critical race theory, which is justifiably mm-hmm. appalling, and we've got to do something about that. So it seems like they're coming at us with so many bad ideas and so many bad policies that this financial catastrophe is kind of lost in the shuffle. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you having trouble getting people's attention? Well, you know, it is interesting because now we have, as we speak, this new Delta variant to the COVID. Mm-hmm. So again, this diverts attention away from you know, the, the catastrophe that is going on financially, because people are understandably concerned about, you know, the life and death issue of COVID. And if you noticed, every time there's some new, you know, news about COVID or outbreak, we need more government, more and more and more government. The CDC is probably the most incompetent agency in the history yeah. of the United States. And yet we continue to Which we knew them. before all this, but yeah. now they've really... I mean, you know, we were giving them, you know, ten, fifteen billion dollars a year to prepare for a pandemic, but they were too busy studying, you know, gun violence and LBGDQ issues and and uh, you know things like that, not keeping their eye. And now we're, you know, now we're putting their, our faith in the CDC. I mean, I think it's a perfect example of an agency that lost its mission, didn't accomplish what it was supposed to do. And what do we do? The Democrats say, oh, we have got to double or triple the CDC budget. But it's so upsetting when you see something like the Supreme Court ruling, which allowed the CDC's uh, <laughs> uh, ban on, on, the, on the evictions, on, on evictions yeah. when in fact most of these businesses or most of the real estate in America is owned by small business people. They're owned by little people. They're not big corporations. Great point. And so they're hurting, the, they're hurting a, a whole number of people that they're pretending to uh, help. Yeah. No, I mean, a great, great point. I mean, the way I put it is like, if we wanted to, our solution to the hunger problem in America is to let people go into the grocery stores and steal whatever they want. Well, I mean, you're not going to have any grocery stores, right? Yeah. But, you know, the left loves to, this is, these are called second order effects. See, the difference between us and them, they don't understand what second order effects are. They say, oh, we're going to allow people to stay in their house and they're not going to even have to pay rent. What does that mean? It means you're not going to have any more affordable housing in America. Anymore. Right. Why, why would anybody build an apartment building? Right. <laughs> people don't have to pay their rent. I mean, the, these people are going, a lot of them are going bankrupt, by the way, Bill. I mean, and these are not rich people. I have friends who own, you know, rental apartments and, and rental housing, and that's their living. That's what they, I, if people I, don't I, pay their I, rent, they don't have any money. I, I, I did a show on this. I think yeah. probably 85% of the housing units in America that are rented are owned, are, are rented like, 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 like one to four units per yeah. that's and they're not, they're not big corporations. Yeah. That's I a great my, point. My I didn't number, know, I did not know it's that. It's a tiny, it's, so the number of so-called corporate owners of these apartments are they're few and far between. Yeah. Uh, so people think, oh, these are these shyster, you know, wealthy landlords that are you know evil and so on, and that's just not the reality. Uh, here's the thing: it's I'm all you're, you're, my my head is exploding with interesting things. You know, you and I needed to do a show on the laws of economics because you know there are things like the second order effects. There's also the seen and the unseen. Right. Supply and demand, they're like 10 things that if people understood it, 
we'd have better policy uh, decisions. Of course, we've now got Nancy. When's the last time you think Nancy Pelosi uh, balanced her checkbook? I mean, she let. Mm -hmm. I guess she lets uh, somebody else do that. Let's speculate. This is. I. I think this is going to pass. I think we can put people in the streets, but it seems like there's so much political momentum that for this. So I think we can. I think we can dramatically change the direction of this. I don't know if we can stop it, but I think we can take out a lot of the worst things. I mean, let me give you one another example of something we didn't talk about. They have a new provision in this bill that's never been implemented before in the history of the United States, which would basically say that um, if you die. Um, all of the assets that built up the capital gain that, you know, you'd have to pay your heirs, your sons, daughters, grandkids would have to pay a massive tax uh, on, on the appreciation of those assets at the time you die. Well, that's going to kill family owned businesses. It's going to kill them. I mean, the government's going to now take half of the estate. You're going to literally under the Biden budget. I'm not, I'm not being, uh, hyperbolic here. You're going to have people having to sell the farm, sell the ranch, sell the family business to pay the taxes. This is so contrary to America. You mean the government gets the business, not the, I mean, the reason people build up a family, that's their legacy. Your legacy is what you leave to your kids and, and, and grandkids. Uh, you know, I think about people like my dad, they worked, you know, 50, 60 hours a week for 50 years to build up a business so they could pass it on to their kids. That's the American way. There's nothing wrong with that. And they want to basically stop that transmission. Uh, and, and it, you know, family-owned businesses are really a hallmark of the American society. we got to wrap up. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. We've got about there's 43 so many hours of things. things you and I, right? we talk about all this stuff but do you, I, do, you, do you agree with me on this family-owned business thing? I do. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, dag, it's a dagger in the heart it of, is. The, of, of the whole of, American of, idea. The whole American idea. Right. It's an attack on property. It's an yeah. attack on. It's an intergenerational attack. It's, I mean, to you go back 150 years. Tocqueville wrote about, you know, this about Americans build up their farms and build up, you know, the, and these were family owned, and it really is the spinal cord of the economy. And when you think about it, if you wanted to move towards government control, it means over time more and more of the assets of the country will be owned by government because they'll just tax them away. Well, my, you know, my view about the end game for the left whatever we want to call them, is that they're always, there's this view, sort of in 1984, we had Winston, the single guy, lived in this small apartment. There was no civil society, there were no churches, there was no small business, it was just right. the individual and the state. Right. And that seems like where we're going. I mean, if you look what happened with the pandemic, they took out tens of, tens of millions of small businesses as a consequence of the lockdowns. And if they go after this intergenerational transfer, as you're describing, and all of a sudden all these small businesses are getting attacked from another way, mm -hmm. um, we're going to, and then we big corporations are making They'll buy them up. <laughs> They'll buy them up. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, this is always such a pleasure. Well, I wish I had a more positive message, <laughs> I I, but I, I I'll just end on a positive note. I really do believe, you know, they work for us. We don't work for them. And, and we are the voices of the country and we can stop this. But we can't just be, you know, as our mutual friend Ed Fulner, the president of, of former president of Heritage says, you can't be a pacifist in this state, in this fight. We need people to take to the streets peacefully and do whatever you can to stop this assault on the American ideal. You, one other quick thing I know, we're not, but you always, you know, you, you always talk about Western civilization and this is an assault against Western civilization that we're facing right now. You were right about that. You convinced me. <laughs> I didn't believe it. We've been going at I, this for 20 now years I, now. I know, and I know. I th they're not that bad, but no. they are. Yes, they this are. This is an assault <laughs> against the whole idea of human progress. I, I mean, it is. Okay, this is part one. We're going to come <laughs> back for part two and then part three. This is going to be a continuing conversation. You were here before. We'll get you back. Uh, the barbarians are at the gates, folks. You know, we got to stop them. I'd say the them. barbarians are inside. <laughs> we, we're going to do hand-to-hand -hand combat here. So we've been watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with my great friend and, and brilliant economist, Steve Moore. And we're talking about uh, um, our concern that economic policy has gone out of control. And next time we'll come back, we're going to talk about some of the lines of action where we think we can get involved to, to push back against this, this onslaught against freedom. 
So anyway, thanks for watching, Steve. Again, thank, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill Walton Show, the Bill Walton Show .com, and we're on also all the major uh, pod podcast platforms and and YouTube and and the other other sources of, uh, of of news. So anyway, thanks for joining, and we'll see you again soon. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.